I should just say that Takashi did a cell biology uh, degree in Kyoto, uh, moved to Germany and converted to mouse embryology at a Max Planck in Freiburg. And he has had his own group in EMBL Heidelberg for at least uh, six years or so now. Um, he began life as a MD, but uh, came to physics uh, because it was forced on him by his embryonic structures. In contrast to many of us who went from physics to biology, he has gone in the reverse as, as forced by his system. And he will tell us a bit about that now. Takashi, please. Thank you, Eric, for your introduction. And, uh, can you hear me? It's OK? Yes, you're very good. OK, very good. So we study a um, multicellular self-organization using early mammalian embryos as a model system. And the key question um, overarching the studies in my lab is this, what underlies robustness in development? And this is actually the reason why actually we stay working with embryos rather than stem cells, because we are interested in numbers, underlying mechanisms, and also variabilities in the systems. And um, early mammal embryo is particularly suitable for addressing this kind of questions with high regulatory capacities. And the key features of the early mammal development is the lack of polarity in the beginning of their life. So you see in all sites, there is no polarity yet. That is in contrast with uh, many other model organisms such as C. elegans and Drosophila, in which this uh, localized determinants uh, play a key role in pattern with embryos. Now, um, that means uh, mammary embryos will have to uh, break symmetry on its own, and they do so uh, typically um, and resulting in the formation of the very heterogeneous gene expression pattern that you can see here before they eventually establish a nice pattern in the so-called blast cyst. Now, um, it is because of this uh, sort of high heterogeneous population uh, undergoing through these processes that basically um, um, hindered our understanding of fundamental questions such as uh, symmetry breaking and the embryo patterning during this process. And this is how actually we set about to uh, start mapping this process at every single cell uh, during this uh, early few days, starting from one cell to around 100 cell stage, going from last stage. So we basically started uh, mapping every single cell on transcriptome, and indeed it shows that early cells on those cells, and actually here in this case in gray, uh, it's um, in terms of transcriptome, they actually exhibit highly um, heterogeneous expression pattern between cells, and they progressively segregate on their own to different populations before they eventually form two population of cells. So indeed, um, supporting this idea that early cells, although they are equipotent, they exhibit highly variable gene expression and progressively forming different uh, cell types. And now in terms of dynamics, uh, so we also developed a number of uh, advanced microscopes in collaboration. And this most recent one, right is the microscopy, allowed us to track every single cell from this stage to the end stage. And also uh, this uh, resolution is high enough that we can apply automatic segmentation linear track. And from that, we can basically uh, measure the um, cell uh, lineage uh, division pattern, cell size and shape differences. So all this information essentially gave us the numbers and names and during all these first stages and up to 100. However, uh, this still didn't give us a sort of um, satisfactory answer to the question like symmetry breaking or uh, patterning mechanisms. Uh, this is primarily because of this uh, highly variable uh, 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 systems and process in space and time. And, um, and also uh, uh, multiple parameters intermingling and to play a role during these um, processes. Um, so in summary, um, so mass embryos starting from one cell to reach this plastic stage, there are many paths that, that they take um, to basically this process. And this, um, um, at the same time, but this also variability reminded us that uh, this um, remarkable capacity that uh, embryo can um, still correct and uh, adjust to reach this uh, um, um, blast cyst patterning to allow for the further development. So there must be some mechanism to ensure this robustness and that's how actually we became interested in understanding what actually the mechanism underlies this um, sort of robust um, formation of this pattern in the embryos. Um, 
Now, um, I try to uh, show you sort of three stories. So each after each of stories, I can sort of open the session for questions. So our first story that I wanted to share with you is uh, a published work on, uh, several years ago uh, that was carried out by a very talented uh, student at that time, uh, who is now foster at UCFF, uh, Katya. And uh, we studied um, uh, symmetry breaking in the mass embryo because as I said, in the beginning, um, all um, cells, although they are highly variable in gene expressions, in terms of potency and division pattern, there is no nuclear uh, asymmetry. So they are, we consider that they are um, in principle symmetric. Now, what we have known already by then is basically at this stage, they start uh, breaking symmetry first within the cell. So you can see that in the beginning, there is basically no direction within the cell, but they basically assemble this uh, red part, which is called uh, apical domain. It's sort of part of the separality. And this um, form the asymmetry in the cell are oriented along in, inside the outside axis, as you can see here. Now, this sort of axis established at the extra stage in the cell is also used by the embryo to basically form a different cell population. Now you can see this a bit different part, inside the part and out of, outside the part that correspond to the first lineage established in the mass embryos. So now the symmetry breaking in the cell is sort of transformed to the symmetry breaking in the embryo across the cells. So now, however, the, the process that undergoes this uh, sort of symmetry breaking in the several rounds is actually very variable again, and the expression is different. So that's why actually we have not very clear what is actually the crucial symmetry breaking cue to drive this process. So that's why actually uh, the key sort of new um, strategy that she introduced and developed um, um, is actually to reduce the complexity so that we can measure and control the different parameters separately from each other. So a uh, remarkable capacity that mass embryos have is basically uh, to uh, maintain the sort of temporal program where we can manipulate special program. So what it shows here is that you can isolate a single cell from this complex embryo and put it in the culture. And this single cell, now it's basically specially sort of reset the special information because it has no contact in communications, but actually they maintain the temporal program. So now um, they sort of recapture this complex process that basically is happening in the embryo in a very simple fashion. And depending on what question we want to answer, we can basically tune our complexity into the minimum level so that we can actually monitor and measure different parameters during this process. So that's how she did. So basically we're particularly interested in the process which is single cell isolated from the edge cell embryo before they have like symmetry in the single cell and then they assemble this apical domain on its own, this self-assembly of apical domain at the cellular state of organization. And that they use to basically break symmetry between two cells and they eventually making a sort of mini elastic formation. So this itself is sort of known, but now we can use this system to basically uh, measure different parameters and characterize the causal relationship between these parameters. To cut the long story short, basically what she discovered was this indeed this apical domain, this red part, is playing a key role functionally to basically differentiate these two cell types in the biological sort of gene expression patterns. And how did he did it? Basically, did relatively straightforward in biology to basically test the requirement because we can use genetics and if you remove some factors to basically block formation of this factor, then you can test whether that parameter is required or not, but how, how we did it. And indeed, we can sort of we can show that this parameter is required, necessary for this or this differentiate to happen. But typically more difficult for us biologists is basically to um, build up something to test the sufficiency of the system. And this kind of actually sort of reduced system allows us to test this because now we have sort of this cell, it's sort of naive cell that we can basically add things and we can synthesize the apical domain. And we, after many trials of different methods, actually then she sort of came back to the classic strategy to induce apical domain as we want in an ectopic manner. So the way she did is actually to um, transplant and micro manipulation. You can take a piece of the apical domain from another cell and you can put it next to the sort of this naive cell and induce fusion by viral component 
And in that way, you can transplant effectively Africa domain, as you can see here, so that you can control space and time. And that, if you do that, you can then test whether this domain is actually sufficient to drag all this process as it would predict from the observation that we had before. And if you do that, indeed, actually we show that only when you transplant this apical domain, but not when you transplant this non-apical, this normal membrane from other cell, then this domain can indeed induce the sort of asymmetric uh, spindle orientation that actually we showed from this study earlier. And then also the is fate specification, this part that inherit this apical domain always differentiate into one cell type and the other is certain type. So these are fast symmetry breaking in terms of cell fate and that we can control by transplanting and manipulating the apical domain. But for the first time, it allowed us to say that this particular domain is functionally required or sufficient for the, this uh, fast uh, symmetry breaking of the mass embryo. So this is sort of like a short story. And then, uh, however, now this is how we use different kind of system to basically test the functional relationship between different parameters. Now, um, but still, uh, this doesn't really uh, explain the story because as you may notice that at this point, at six stage, the number not, doesn't really match because if now this happens to many cells, which is actually the case, surprisingly more than 85% of the case, they always divide this way and make a different cell types and as each cell. And actually coming back to embryo, we found indeed that actually as many as 75% of the embryo, they form the same thing, same division pattern and the same sort of two cell types. However, there's a problem because now number doesn't fit. As you can see, geometrically, they cannot really accommodate all these uh, root cells inside because as you can see out of 16 cells, we know that it's only possible to put up to four cells in the inside and typically it's around 2.3 of an average number of inside cells within the six embryo, so it doesn't really fit. So there must be some additional mechanism to ensure this robust inside outside pattern. So what is this mechanism? So now if, when Katia looked more closely, so now if we look at this cell, which has a large, this apical domain, as I mentioned, this marked in red. So this domain, as you see, every cell has this domain. This is eight cell stage. Now I'm going to show movie. And this cell, every cell divide. And as they divide, as I showed, basically they all segregate this domain into only one daughter. That daughter remains outside and the other daughter you know, going inside. So that is similar to breaking of cells. Now what happens is basically you can see this divide and put this domain into only this daughter and the other daughter is inside. As you see, this daughter is actually squeezed out and I can, this is actually the daughter that has come from the parents and initially in the inside. So it's a, this is scam. This cell has a large apical domain, divide, segregate this domain only to this daughter and the other daughter wanted to go inside. However, no problems happen because now there's not enough space to accommodate all those inner cells because they're all making these inner cells here. And then they sort of have to compete for the inner position and those basically lose, they have to go out. That's how that they happen. And actually this happens at the 26%. And in this way, um, it clearly indicates that it is not division pattern itself, but it is actually eventual cell position after this competition that defines cell fate. So in this case, for example, they all undergo asymmetric division by this apical segregation. But as a result, uh, quite many of them actually ended up forming the symmetric cell fate. So in this way, the sort of, there must be some adjustment and there was sort of patterning after this initial symmetry breaking before they can form appropriate and robust uh, this patterning like this thing. The mass embryos. Now, clearly, it indicates the importance of cell positioning and also sensing of cell position and how actually they can coordinate this cell position and fate. And that's how actually we became interested and we started to study about the mechanics. And uh, so, this is the end of the first story, and uh, I could um, answer some questions if there's anything that is unclear so far. Eric? Uh, if anyone has something, raise their hand promptly and they will be recognized. 
Okay. Can I just jump in real quick? So those those inner uh, cells that go to the boundary, they gain an apical domain subsequently to, uh, and how long does that take? Yeah, actually, indeed, that is right. And uh, the previous movie it shows basically as they go out, they actually form an apical domain. So typically, it would take uh, several hours. So the whole cell cycle is something like uh, 10 hours at this time. And it takes uh, three, four hours. Once they are exposed to outside, actually they, so so I should have said actually, but in this study, we also show that each cell at this point, every single cell, they have a potency to basically self-organize apical domain when there is some surface free of contact. And if you have a free like this contact, they just have to form apical domain. So basically when spontaneous, when they go out, they will always form apical domain. So all these outer cells, will eventually form apical domain. So only inner cells that has no surface exposed, they form, they don't form apical domain. But every other cell, when they form apical uh, free surface, they, then they basically they would, they would form apical domain. So yeah, that's right. Okay, I guess a, a plunge onward. <clears throat> So uh, uh, continue. Okay, that's fine. Okay, then uh, yeah, then uh, we can uh, um, go to the next step. So we became the interest in what actually mechanics underlie this coordination between cell position and fate. And that's how actually um, uh, postdoc at that time, um, um, Jim Leon, my tray, uh, had introduced a, a, a sort of classic method to our field, which is basically this micro uh, uh uh, suction, and you can see that by controlling the pressure and measuring this curvature here and making sure this diameter of curvature is the same as this uh, diameter of the pipette, by applying Laplace law, we can basically uh, deduce the uh, tension acting on the surface cortex. And that's how you can do with this, uh, you can see movie and you basically suck and make sure this is shape. And you can then deduce the vertical tension as long as there's a surface on all these uh, surface area cells. And that's how actually he used this method to characterize mechanics of compaction at the eight cell stage, and that's how he published in this study. And by doing that, he basically discovered another very um, interesting phenomena. And if you isolate a single cell, because at that time, everyone is taking things out and make a video system in my lab. So now if you do this, and if you just let it uh, stay in the dish, and you can see now this shows the curvature of this cortex or membrane by different colors. And if you do that, if you see, uh, this eight cell single cell, if you take it out of the embryo, you can see that this is very uh, interesting, sort of very you know, cyclic uh, curvature change, which you can see in the chimera, that basically um, a very regular oscillation in curvature, and it coincides with the accumulation of actin. So it is. It seems to be uh, there's a cons uh, uh, universally conserved um, cycle, same as like the sulfur the cycle of this actomycin contraction is around 80 seconds in this, in this system. By isolating single cells and releasing from the adhesion, basically they can um, I, I recapture this, uh, they can exhibit this um, very continuous, regular uh, cyclic base. So that he discovered in this study, but now uh, the study that I want to discuss with you in my talk in the second part is to use these two methods to characterize the uh, cells that after symmetry breaking and how actually these two cell types inside and outside, how they behave in terms of uh, positioning and phase differentiation. So now, um, so these are stage after um, uh, symmetry breaking, so it's a 16 cell stage, uh, there could be two population cells as a result of the, the, the asymmetric division as I mentioned earlier. So if you now measure those cells on the surface in terms of cortical activation, you can see there are a sort of cells with soft cortex and a more sort of tense cortex, as you can see here. And because this method is not invasive, we can basically then develop further. And if you do that, you can see that those with higher cortical tension always end up being in a position. So that sort of makes sense in terms of mechanics because when you are uh, high in putting on the cortex, basically whatever you count to the surface, you basically more effective in stretching them and basically wrapping itself. So that effectively brings yourself to the inside of the mass. 
So that basically makes sense. That's why actually in a way we predicted that um, uh, the one inside that that was the case here. Um, the same things we can also test by isolating this uh, uh, pair of cells from um, 16, or we can put uh, eight cell single cell and we can divide to make this pair of cells at an equivalent of 16 cells. So we write it this way. And if you do that, uh, you can see there's a curvature here. So this would indicate actually from the observation uh, that we know that this cell eventually basically clone this other cell, this yellow cells, and they basically differentiate into the inner cell type. While these cells being pulled and wrapping up the blue cells, will be eventually differentiated the other cell types of vector one. Now, by looking at this early stage of this pair of cells, we can also observe this difference in the surface cortex dynamics. And you may notice, you may notice that there are some sort of more contractile property here. And you can measure this by looking at this curvature and the life act DFP. You can see clearly that this uh, inner cell cortex has higher contractility compared to the other cell type. So this phenomena, the difference in contractility properties, is actually the sort of same things as we observed, we measured the cortical tension here and there. So it's basically sort of simplified with this version of the same phenomena, different contractility, but showing a different phenomena, you can see this difference. So this sort of all together, we sort of anticipated that. But the key question that we wanted to answer was what are the origin of those differences? So what makes this difference between these two in outer uh, cell types? To identify, look for this uh, initial sort of symmetry breaking trigger. So we looked into the parent of those two cells, which is A cell. So this is the same A cell and then the same analysis. And now I'm showing the movie and these are uh, sort of two uh, different colors, coverage and life act. By looking at this, you might notice that there's a part of the membrane that does not contract as much as the other part. So this part, this part. So this part is right here. So this basically lacks the contraction. And this was apical domain. So that's how actually we knew um, Africa domain has a distinct structure microscopically, and they lack actomycin at this point. And that actually could explain why this only Africa domain does not contract as much as the other part of the cell. Now what happens is basically during this stage in the eight cell situation, there's the Africa domain and the lateral, the lateral domain, and they are dividing apical domain, as I mentioned in my cardiac study, we know that because of apical domain, they always segregate this apical domain to only one daughter because they always undergo this asymmetric division because of the apical domain driving spindle orientation. Now, you always form this apical domain uh, with one cell and the other domain that does not inhibit apical domain and those same pair of cells, which will now put it in another um, field here, the same pair, you can see already right after division, there's a difference in terms of contract. You can see these cells contract much more than these cells. So this led us to interesting hypothesis that actually this apical basal polarization or symmetry breaking at the eight cell stage might be actually not only symmetry breaking for cell fate and apical basal polarization, but also might be symmetry breaking for the mechanical property of the cortex. So the apical domain softened the cortex and the basilateral domain maintained highly contractile property. And this apical domain, because they also orient the spindle along the axis, would ensure that actually this apical domain is only given to one daughter cells, which basically dictates how they behave in terms of mechanics in the following stage. And this is a very simple model. And because of the simplicity in this is geometry in a two cell and this system, uh, my shared postdoc with uh, Francois also um, um, got involved in this uh, study and basically calculated how much actually uh, numbers we need to have to allow this system, this event to happen. So at that point, we had an earlier model um, by uh, Elvia again to explain the uh, morphogenetic change of compaction. So we call this as a compaction parameter alpha. So from this earlier study, 
we basically characterize that the starting from this equivalent um, sort of um, 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 cell um, separated situation during compaction in the reduced system, what happens is basically the alpha, alpha parameter, which is basically ratio between the surface tension and interface tension, we basically reduce from one, which is equal between these two because there's no adhesion, to going down to 0 0.2, basically the ratio between this and this is going to reduce to five to one. And that is a sort of mechanical explanation of the compaction from this to that. And that we had in area study. Now, at that point, all cells, as I mentioned, are sort of equivalent and there's no difference. Now, at the 16th stage, we will introduce uh, the second parameter, which is basically the difference because symmetry is not broken, the difference between two cells, which is uh, now we call it the delta, the ratio between this surface cortex and this surface cortex. Now, based on his calculation, he basically predicted that for this kind of morphogenesis to happen, this delta has to be larger than one plus two alpha. So now we know that alpha has to go down from 1 to 0 0.2 in this uh, compaction, and we have to maintain this compaction for this to happen. That means delta has to be larger than 1 plus 0 0.4, means basically if the difference between two surface tension between two cells is larger than 50%, then this should be able to work. So this is a prediction from the model calculation of the Herbert. Now we can test this prediction by experiments. So how can we do this? So we can prepare cells of this stage of the embryo. Everything is same, but the only difference we introduce is basically the difference in cortical tension, but in a way that they are still completely normal. So in this heterozygous, genetically modified heterozygous embryo, the mouse is completely normal, viable, just completely happy. But if you measure the cortical tension of the cells, because of this half amount of myosin at this stage of the embryo, they have slightly reduced cortical tension to have to be completed. In contrast, why it has 500 fit point on average. So that's why actually by reducing the amount of myosin, or the mice is viable, the cell is a bit softer and the difference is 2.5 fold. So according to his prediction, this should basically work and drive this kind of sorting and morphogenesis in this pair of cells. So that's how we should. Checked. And if you see, uh, actually, indeed, actually, this wire type, which is higher, can manage to sort of pull and wrap up itself and other cells. And if you test this by one to all, so this is embryo wire type. This has a, a bit weaker tension. And now the outcome is indeed they stay outside being stretched by those other cells because this tension is smaller. And in contrary, if you have a higher tension, although they have started from other side, they managed to put it in, now differentiated in the phase. So you can see here, indeed supporting this um, hypothesis that actually this differential cortical tension is sufficient to drive the uh, positioning and the fate uh, conversion specification in the early embryos. So taken together, these studies um, um, allowed us to ha have a basic understanding of how initial symmetry breaking and inside outside pattern can be robustly established in the RMS embryos. So as I um, answered actually to the question that I posed in the first part, uh, the initial clue that orient the position of the applicant domain is actually driven by the asymmetry in contact. So if there is no contact, they would have to form apical domain there at a certain time point. Now this apical domain is functionally sufficient, required sufficient to differentiate into one cell type. And the same apical domain is actually also playing a key role in making the symmetry breaking of the mechanics. And that basically differentiate into two cell types inside cells which has higher contractility. And that basically, as I showed in the earlier study, undergo um, competition sort of to win the inner position to differentiate into the the other cell type. And if they fail, possibly because of the lower cortical tension, we don't know how exactly they calculate competition, competition, but then eventually if they move to outside, as I discussed in the earlier part, those now switch to outside position. As soon as they go outside, they would have to form this apical domain because they are always maintaining this property to form apical domain. 
surface in the Mokka domain. So this is how actually, although there are variability in timing and space and how actually to divide, it doesn't matter because as long as you go cycle this process, they eventually establish the surface inside the Asad pattern in a slightly different number in different processes uh, in, the, in the eventual Arima assemblies. There's, so there's, there's a question from Colin, Colin Keller. Okay. Uh, if if I just uh, finish this one slide, then I can I can pull it actually. This has sort of like, um, expected up. So just to finish up, so this sort of might be interesting to just generalize this to so saying that actually based this uh, optical domain that may functionally link between cortical tension asymmetry and positioning and fade. So this is how sort of we sort of generalize this understanding that uh, so feedback this kind of different parameter might be a key for the tissue transformation. Yeah, that's it. So we can go to the uh, break and uh, ask the questions. Yeah, please. Yeah. Colin? Uh, 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 Hello. Hi. Um, so I had a question a few slides back. With, if you could go back to the uh, slide with the surface tension model, the gamma. Yeah. Yeah, so it seems like there's a third so you've measured the two outside surface tensions, gamma CM2 and gamma CM1, but there's a third parameter that seems important in this phase diagram, which is gamma CC. So, and it seems like you've made an assumption about what that is or something about how it behaves. So could you comment on uh, gamma CC? Uh, sorry, gamma CC, you mentioned gamma CC. Okay, I thought that was hard parameter, but very massive, but okay, gamma CC, uh, so this is basically the part of this uh, compaction parameter. So basically to explain mechanically compaction, the ratio between gamma CC and gamma CM will basically, uh, so in this way, alpha decrease. So basically when there is no compaction, cells are sort of separated from each other and then basically all the cortical tension is equal. Now, because of the adhesion, this gamma CC, will decrease and that's how actually um, this alpha during compaction decrease from one to 0.2 because of this uh, establishment of adhesion based by interfering. So you can measure that by looking at the shape? Is that what you're um, saying? In principle, um, we also published that, but in, in principle we can uh, indeed uh, measure uh, uh, infra force by force inference and we did it in collaboration. And uh, yeah, in principle. Yeah, and the data that's quite consistent with this idea. Yeah. Thanks. All right. Um, yeah, we go on to. Well, I'm sorry. Um, <clears throat> a question from. Was. Okay. Uh, yes. Buddha Priya. Yes, hi. Um, just a quick question, which is a um, very interesting talk and uh, fantastic um, analysis. Um, for liquid drops on liquid surfaces, there is um, there are conditions that need to be satisfied by Young and Newman. And I was wondering whether um, whether those conditions, because this uh, these tissue droplets, they're really not liquid droplets, are they? Um, whether you see any kind of modification just purely from a, um, from a materials perspective on uh, the conditions that need to be satisfied at the interface. So the, you mean liquid droplets in the tissues? So the, the drop, you know, the, the tissues, basically the, the cells which are dividing. Yeah. The angles at which they come in, it's, uh, so they're, they're really intermediate between a liquid drop on a solid surface and a liquid drop on a liquid surface. Yeah. And there are, you know, there's, there's two different conditions for a liquid drop on a solid surface and a liquid drop on a liquid surface that needs to be obeyed. For one, you get the young Laplace, and for the other, you get the young Neumann conditions. I see. And I, and I was wondering if, you know, if uh, whether, what happens for your, you know, for one type of one cell type adhering to another? Is this somewhere intermediate or is this follows one or the other? I see. Um, 
we haven't really explored that. That's an interesting possibility to check, but uh, we haven't really explored that um, in our system yet. And okay. uh, so far, we applied Young Laplace law for all this, uh, for inference, all these things. And um, yeah, so that's all we did so far, but we didn't really try to compare this with this liquid liquid and liquid solid interface. You should go on. Yeah, okay, I think uh, I'm a bit of running late, so I just try to, to make it quicker. So what I wanted to, I think maybe quickly introduce the third part of my story is to introduce um, a most recent study, which basically to address the next step, because we are building up complexities. And most recently we introduced to um, this uh, new sort of parameter, which is basically fluid here. So this is pressurized fluid that uh, blast is uh, sort of expand and form here. And from that, uh, we sort of investigate the possible role of the fluid because we didn't really think about fluid at that time. So it was all about cells, but now we sort of began introducing the potential of the fluid, especially pressure. And that's the work of my former postdoc, Joe, uh, who basically um, uh, asked about what is a sort of dimension that how should tissue measure this dimension, how actually those kinds of information can control cells and again fluid. And to make a quick uh, story, um, I think uh, because of the time, I think I probably make it rather quick. And just to sum up, uh, so we uh, basically uh, uh, came to this um, uh, finding that uh, there is uh, two uh, feedback loops. So the one is a positive feedback loop, uh, which is basically uh, driven by cavity expansion, so pressure increase, and that basically stretch cells, and that mature the junction here. And that accommodate further expansion, so it's with a positive feedback loop here. And this is the time scale of several um, days, uh, one day uh, and uh, tens of hours. And in contrast, there's another uh, um, more shorter uh, feedback loop with negative feedback loop because as cells will become more stretched, they start to uh, make a rupture and leak the fluid here. So that is basically the scale of uh, several hours. And it's basically triggered by magnetic entry around the cells. And that's how actually the, there are two uh, positive and negative feedback loop on different time scales. And that basically, according to Maha's uh, model, is sufficient to basically bring the system to proton size. And that's actually how we indeed uh, confirm within this uh, mass embryos. Now, interesting prediction that we did uh, with him was to um, control, manipulate this uh, tension here and junction here, and that basically induce more leakage. And the prediction would be that um, if uh, you uh, decrease tension or increase the leak, that would result in a smaller uh, dimension, smaller size. So this is actually what happened here. So you can see the size of the blast is smaller than compared to the wire type. Importantly, uh, this does not change number of cells. Total number of cells, they divide the same way and they remain constant. And that's how actually the proportion of inner fate, now you can see the number of inner cell mass is increasing. So again, showing that actually the fate of body mass embryos is not really specified by past history, but it's actually controlled flexibly by a sort of feedback in self organization. So this now adding uh, one parameter, luminal pressure here, and that as all together, the small scale feedback between all these different components, robustly control size, shape, which is actually studied from another study from my lab, and also international patterning as I showed in just earlier talk. So that's a uh, sort of the sort of story that I wanted to see. And the last couple of slides, and uh, we now um, begin to explore new areas, so just a couple of unpublished uh, data. So, um, now, um, we haven't solved yet about how actually they form pattern out of this very variable population of cells. So that actually we began to see the impact by the uh, sort of block of the cavity expansion. If you block cavity expansion, this uh, cell fate and sorting is both uh, deteriorated. And that gave us the sort of hypothesis that actually this microlumin actually blasts this cavity is not really coming from one spot, but it's coming from every single uh, interface. And this kind of microlumina might serve as a niche to integrate chemical and biophysical cues. And that's how actually we are testing this kind of hypothesis in different means in the data systems. 
So that is the one work and just one last slide. We are expanding also to different areas. So um, new one of the new area that we are exploring is to uh, build even more complexity. So because now we have built up a one by one different parameters to explain this plastic morphogenesis. Now we're preparing for the next stage, which is basically to make a major morphogenesis to elongate and form the axis and form the castration. So we have recently introduced a sort of 3D GL system to basically capture this uh, process for the following two days. And that you can see with ratchet microscopy, we can then track single cells, you can see that the segment cells automatically. And we can now study the cell shape change and basically in a similar way, we can monitor and measure and pattern in a special temporal control manner that they're trying to prepare for the next sort of stage. With that, I'd like to finish my talk and thank all my former people, in particular, these two uh, excellent biophysics postdocs in my lab, and Jin uh, Leong um, now established his lab for several years by now in the Institute of Curie, and Joe actually now is preparing to start his new lab in the Carnival Institute. And uh, I'm sure they are recruiting, so I just wanted to mention that uh, they're excellent uh, people, young people, and uh, for those interested in this kind of work, I highly recommend those labs. And actually, it's also my lab, we're also in recruiting. So if you're interested, this can be a new area, ambitious postdoc, I'm happy to discuss for future possibilities. That's all, thank you very much, and uh, happy to take any question. Great, thank, uh, thank you for that wild dash through the mouse embryo. Um, maybe I'll ask the first question. Um, there is a difference between mural and polar trophoblast, and that probably has implications for the ability of blastocysts to implant. Do you think those differences perhaps stem from mechanical differences that you outlined, uh, i.e. that the um, one is wrapped around the, uh, the inner cell mass and so on? Possibly, yes. And uh, so we um, are just beginning to see, observe how differ those two populations are in this kind of um, new system. And uh, it is certainly possible, it is, it is uh, maybe as you know, the embryo always um, implant with uh, this cavity side, but not the, this uh, the upside. So there might be some difference and that might uh, contribute to make some particular Morphogenesis that actually we also investigate. It's such an interesting point. Yeah. Other questions, please? <clears throat> uh, I want to ask about the, you should uh, initially um, there are actin waves pulsing on the, on the, um, on the cell. And I want to ask what's, and it was about um, seven second a period or so. Does that stay constant throughout? Um, cell cycle and is it calcium dependent or? Yeah, so those who are interested in this kind of things, I would highly recommend to follow up how John Leon is characterizing these different things. But as far as I, I, I know uh, from his um, data, it appears to be not um, linked necessarily with the cell cycle. It's basically the, the time scale of seconds, 18 seconds, which is similar to the actomycin production for any other organisms. And uh, yeah, but he's now, I think, starting his, his, his topic, yeah. Can people with questions raise their hand? It's easy for me to uh, see who's who without having to scan a huge tableau of images. So uh, raise your hand and you will be recognized. It's easier to organize that way. I believe there are also two questions from the chat. Okay, uh, Berna, uh, do you have it? A... Yes, um, excellent talk, thank you very much. So I was wondering, so you focused on um, early blastomer and differences between ICM and trophectoderm during the first sulfate decision. But I'm wondering whether um, differences in cell mechanics are also important later blastocyst develop. Like, um, have you investigated these principles during primitive endoderm formation? Are the differences between epiblast and primitive endoderm are that account for sorting at this stage? Yeah, so this is certainly the question that we'd like to pursue, that this is basically the mechanism of this sorting and the eventual pattern formation at this point. And we just begin to measure all these things. And uh, probably it's still premature to mention this, but uh, 
we are sort of open to different possibilities. It might be different adhesion, it might be different contractility or yet another mechanism. So there might be, there must be some mechanism to ensure that those surface cells are moving from us inside because initially it's very chaotic. It's basically all mixed up. And that somehow they can make sure that there's a clear pattern of brassies. And how, is, how they can do this in coordination with cell fate, cell mediation is rather open question right now. And we are trying to investigate that now. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, a, question from, a question from Amit Singh. Yeah, hi. Uh, um, I, I wanted to ask, uh, you showed uh, little oscillations in the lumen uh, size. Do you, uh, at least it's theoretically predicted, do you see it experimentally as well? Uh, oscillation of human? What lumen volume. Ah, lumen volume. Ah, okay. Yeah, so sorry, I didn't have time to um, explain all this, but it's published, so you could also look at it. But basically, mm -hmm. there's sort of like, a, this is what we're about to mention, this oscillation. Oh, okay. uh, this is actually, uh, um, I didn't have time, but this is what to mention briefly about this uh, thing's leakage. This is what we call collapse. So, uh, so basically, the increase in diameter, and they basically make a rupture of this adhesion size, and make a leakage. And then they basically uh, repair and recover, expand, and breakage. And repair. So they do this repeat. It is not regular. I mean, it is totally different from the oscillatory um, regular uh, this contraction that I just discussed earlier about this uh, cortical contractility. Mm -hmm. And this is about uh, leakage. And this is basically um, irregular. But this is sort of the uh, necessary mm -hmm. component to reach plateau because this provides this. Uh, shorter time scale um, negative feedback to basically bring this into the into the yeah this, this size. Okay. Yeah. Thanks. Uh, 